And um, this meeting will be recorded, so we'll send you a follow-up email later on with that information on how to access the recording. So just give me one second here. We let everybody get logged in. Oops. Looks like we're ready to go. All right, let's get started. Um, hello everyone, my name is Beth. I am a librarian at the Milwaukee Public Library East Branch. Usually tonight I'm here at home. Um, and thank you for joining us this evening for our Sculpture Milwaukee local artist feature. Assisting me tonight is my colleague in the programming librarian for Milwaukee Public Library, Christina. She's in the background, so please make sure to um, chat with the panelists if you have any tech issues or questions, and we'll get you the help that you need. A few housekeeping items. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box and use that question and answer box throughout the presentation for any questions that you may have. We will have time at the end to address any of those questions. The presentation is being recorded and we will email you a link with the recording and any links for resources, books, and websites that we talk about tonight so you don't need to feel like you need your write a bunch of notes down while we're speaking. Um, also in the background is the person that helped form this partnership between Milwaukee Public Library and Sculpture Milwaukee, Mary Lou Kinode. Welcome, she's hanging out with us and watching the presentation as well. She's the former Director of Curatorial Affairs and Education for Sculpture Milwaukee and is now the Executive Director of the Black Box Fund. Mary Lou was essential for bringing this program to our patrons, so I just wanted to give her a big thank you. Um, Sculpture Milwaukee, for those of you who are not quite familiar with it, is a nonprofit organization transforming downtown into a cultural landscape every year and bringing sculpture for free to anyone who would like to see it. It's privately funded and open at no cost to visitors and makes culture accessible for everyone, making Milwaukee a better place. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our featured guest this evening, Tony Tassett. Welcome, Tony. I have a little bio that I'll quick read and then I'll turn it over to you. Tony Tassett is a nationally recognized sculptor with artworks in museums, including MOCA Los Angeles, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Kunst Museum Frankfurt in Germany, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Tony was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and was included in the 2016 Whitney Biennial. He's also a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, Where are you zooming in with us this evening? Uh, well, we have a place in Chicago, but really since COVID hit, we, we also have a place in Sawyer, Michigan, which is like mm -hmm. an hour and a half away and uh, both of our studios, my wife, Judy Ledgewood and I have other buildings on this land and we both have studios. So we're here all the time. So we're in Sawyer, Michigan. Very cool. How's the weather? <laughs> Pretty cold, I'm sure, just like we were. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. I bought a snowblower this year, the biggest one they got. And I view it. There you go. That's amazing. Well, we're so, happy to have you here um what kind of prompted us asking you as your local to you know milwaukee so we feel like we um get to see a lot of your work and especially because of this piece that we're looking at right now on the slideshow can you tell us a little bit more about it yeah um this is called blob monster hopefully it's been up for a little while maybe some of uh people have seen it in person and uh you know it's always tricky to talk about work because I don't want to ruin it for anybody if they if, they, if people have been looking at it and they have their own ideas about it. Uh, so I'll talk about it. So I'd like to talk about it, but maybe a little more abstractly about about uh, and not that there's any secret, not that there's any not that it has any very specific meaning. Um, somebody gave me a compliment once they said that my work was easy to recognize and uh, hard to under, hard to comprehend. So I kind of like that. Um, but anyway, first of all, it's uh, sculpturally, I made the thing using this material, like a two part foam. So it's this dripping process. So you have this kind of sculpture process, almost like 1970s sculptural process 
um, making the sculpture and then you and then it stops at a certain point. So you have a kind of, you know, good old formal play between something that's dripping and yet is solid at the same time. And the form is kind of out of control that versus then I made it into a big monster. So so it's this kind of abstraction versus a pictorial thing and this process versus something pictorial. The colors themselves, um, again, I'm trying to, I guess I'm, you know, in sculpture you create this tension between um, polarities, between um, opposites. So my, you know, my first thought was, ooh, I'll make it like a slimy green monster. But then I, then I thought it was more complicated, this sort of colorful, you know, melting ice cream, poppy colors. So, uh, you know, what does it mean? I don't know, I, but I think it's sort of big and loud and American and both sort of cute and monstrous at the same time, I, I think that, that was the goal, um, which I think a lot of stuff is, you know, like television mm -hmm. or I don't know. It felt very, um, and it's also, I guess I'm playing with, you know, it's public art, it's outdoor artwork. And, you know, I'm really just trying to make things that are sort of, I mean, I don't mean to be too silly, but is open to as wide an audience as possible that little mm -hmm. kids would get something out of it. And uh, so I don't know, it's a monster, but it's also really playful at the same time. I mean, you could interpret it different ways and I hope people do. But I think mm -hmm. that's that's as much as I'd like I'd say about it at this point. I think that's great. Um, we're planning a trip to go and visit with I have two little kids and I think they'll really, really connect with what you're saying and they're gonna really want to take a picture with it. And I love the colors, it's just so eye catching. It's just different. especially with against the gray downtown, you know. Great. That's great. All right. Um, so um, this is just introducing you again. So thank you for being here. And then another reason we really wanted to connect with Sculpture Milwaukee specifically is they asked all the artists that um, put forth pieces this year to include kind of a reading, suggested reading list or books that either inspire some of their work or that they enjoy reading. And um, we were really drawn to the one that you picked, which is called Fantasy Land by Kurt Anderson. Um, how America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History, which I think is a really timely choice, especially for current events and what we've all been kind of experiencing in the past year during this pandemic. So do you want to talk a little bit more about why you chose this as sure. one of the book? Sure. Uh, I read this book a couple years ago. Uh, Kurt Anderson is, he's a journalist. He started Spy Magazine, if you know that, and he has, mm -hmm. he's on the radio, and he's a kind of a pop culture, I don't know, opinion writer, I guess you would say. And this book called Fantasyland, I mean, this was in, it's not about Trump, but it it's sort of about, it starts with Martin Luther and it talks about, he tries to make a case that there's something uniquely American that makes us prime for frankly fake news and um, a kind of a, a world of fantasy where we, he even he ties it into a kind of American idea of like we manifest our own destiny. We, you know, our idea is is the best so that um, our thinking is 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 the right way. And he goes through from religion. He talks about how religion came. It starts with Martin Luther, because with Martin Luther, you don't have to go through a priest to speak to God. You can speak directly to God. And then he goes through religion and he talks about how kind of entertaining religion got when it came to the United States. And, um, uh, but it goes through all, I mean, it, it's a screed, but it's really a fun, he's funny and it's a fast read. And what I like is he, he talks about culture. So he'll go from fashion to music, to television, to, to theory. Um, and he, he, I mean, he's definitely a left-wing guy. However, he will critique the left just as much as the right. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I don't want to get go down too long, or big a rabbit hole, but for me as an artist and um, is kind of postmodern theory that one of the things about postmodern theory, I mean, I went to school in the 80s and we all read, you know, Foucault and, and Derrida and 
uh, and one of the cool things about postmodernism was that truth was kind of rel was relative. That it depends on where you're at, right? It depends mm -hmm. on, and in one and in one way, that's great because it opened up lots of marginalized voices who hadn't been heard before. And we're, you know, we've been going through that for 30, 40 years at least. The downside is kind of what we're going through now, this like, you know, choose your own reality. I mean, people who watch Fox versus people who watch MSNBC, it's so, they're just different. Um, so anyway, this book kind of makes a case. I don't know if I even buy it. I don't know if that's specifically an American thing, but it was, it, it's, a, it's a provocative, you know, it's not heavy theory, it's fun. Um, and he makes all these connections. And I, I really, it's just, you know, every couple of years a book comes along that, that just is, um, you know, gets your head flowing a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, blah, 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 that was my choice. That was my pick for, for book. Yeah, I found it. It's really like connects back to your piece where it's kind of this fantasy of this creature and social media and how we kind of visualize everything. And I read an Atlantic article by the author of this book that was a shorter version of the book because I didn't have time to read the entire thing. And it was really, it put it into historical perspective and showing that this moment in time isn't as unique as we might think it is and reflecting back on these other instances of similar things happening. So I think it's a great thesis that he explores really well in well, this he, work in a really I mean, approachable way. I don't want to get off the subject, but I mean, one of the <laughs> things I remember him saying was, uh, oh, like people, you know, adults dressing up like football, you know, in foot or in sports clothes. And that's weird because it's, it's so childish in a way, you know, like, you're mm -hmm. up, like you're, you know, you're going to be a sport, you know, grown men dressing as though they're, you know, football players or something. But I thought about that, looking at these images of uh, the Capitol, there was, have you seen this? There's this flag with Trump, but superimposed like on Rambo's body. Oh, I didn't see that. No. Oh, yeah, no, big flag. And it's, and I just thought it's so childish. You know what I mean? And it's, I mean, it's fantasy. And of course they know it's fantasy, but um, anyway, so this book really like, you, you know, was really prescient um, to all that stuff. It just keeps, you know, and this was written, mm -hmm. I think 2017. Yeah, anyway, I should shut up and we could shoot. <laughs> Very good. Um, just a quick thank you to all the sponsors of Sculpture Milwaukee, of course, for helping bring all this wonderful art to downtown. So thank you for that. Um, and of course, make sure to stop by the Sculpture Milwaukee website where you can get a map and see some of the pieces have been taken down because they're not quite up to staying up during the harsh winters that we have here. But though there's pictures, there's audio tours, there's tons of information, including further reading recommendations from the other artists that were featured. So I definitely recommend you check that out and I'll include the link um, in our follow-up email. Um, so welcome. Um, let's talk a little bit more about kind of your the broader overview of your work and what materials you work with and some of your favorite things. Um, I was, I'm so drawn to this piece here, this rainbow, where, where was this installed? Well, uh, this is a real dream. It's at uh, Sony Entertainment, which is in Culver City, California, but um, there, this is their movie lot, you know, and it's where their TV shows and Jeopardy and blah, blah, blah are all filmed, but it's the old MGM Grand lot. So it's where the Wizard of Oz was filmed, um, as well as Citizen Kane and um, Gone with the Wind. I mean, it's such a historic lot, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I was, I won't go into the, how I got this gig, but it's like a public art commission. Um, and I kind of won the competition with this piece. Um, and it's almost, I think it's 94 feet tall, this uh, rainbow, it's made out of, big steel structure underneath and aluminum. And I mean, it's a totally over the top, you know, sweet piece. Um, I thought about it as, well, it's obvious uh, things to talk about, but also the idea of capturing something that's ephemeral, that's light, but in this solid way, I thought was a cool sculptural thing. And, um, 
you know, certainly spoke to the movies, what the movies were. And it was also something in a catch way, you can sort of see it for miles around. So mm -hmm. it becomes this icon, literally. Um, I mean, when I make public art things, I really don't want to make, you know, you're, I'm competing with landscape and trees and buildings. So I'm really, I really want to, I mean, I make stuff so big just because it's, um, I just don't want to be consumed by the, you know, I don't want to just decorate. I want to really affect the space. So that's what my goal was. It's cool. What I think is cool about this piece is uh, you see the reflection in the window. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, I don't, can everyone see my pointer here? Yeah, kind of a second. Right here. And uh, then I like it. having the car here for scale. Yeah, scale. So anyway. That's, that's amazing. California. It's a permanent piece. It's big. Did you have to go up in like a bucket? How was it? Put no, up? I mean, when you work, no, I mean, I'm working with super professionals, this Carlson, but yeah, they had lots of big cranes. It was a huge, it was a huge undertaking. It's like a little mini, you know, St. Louis arch almost. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. I love that. Wait, All right. right. Um, so this is, it looks, to me, it looks smaller, but I, I don't know, maybe it's huge. We, I don't have a scale here. So um, know, okay, this tough. season, this it's is tough. definitely different than the rainbow. So yes, this is, I mean, I make these outdoor public pieces and then I also make more, I guess you call them discrete. This isn't that small. It's about six feet across and it's somewhat three dimensional. So it comes out from the wall about two feet. Um, it's called Angry Sun. I think I was trying to just, I mean, I'm trying, you know, when I make work, I synthesize so many different things. So I was thinking about the sun as probably one of our first gods, but it's also <laughs> something that's like frightening right now. It's sort of the sun's coming back to eat us up um, even. Uh, so I was trying to bring that together and I was looking at Southeast Asian and, uh, you know, Mexican and all these different, and, and Baroque. And I tried to, you know, and cartoony stuff. And I was trying to bring that all together in this, my version of this sort of angry sun. Um, anyway, you can go on. Somebody who has to wear 90 block to go outside. <laughs> like, I <Yeah>. get it. <laughs> like, yep, I, I, I love it, but I'm a little scared of it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, this piece is a relatively newer piece, also uh, from a show I did last year at Kavi Gupta Gallery in Chicago, and it's made out of cast concrete. It's incredibly heavy. It's about six feet across, or I think five feet across by three and a half feet. And I mean, I made this before all the monuments started being torn down, but mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, Oh, a lot of stuff. I, I was trying to emulate. I mean, the thing about my work is I emulate all these. I don't really have a signature style. I'm sort of looking at all these somewhat known styles. And I was thinking about, about um, WPA sort of sculptures and even sort of fascist sculptures and public artworks from the 30s and earlier, Art Deco, um, brutalist sculptures. And I thought about all that with this eagle head, this sort of decapitated eagle head. It was really based on these, there's the, there are these beautiful deco eagles on a um, post office in Uptown in Chicago. Um, so kind of loosely based on that, but I thought of this fallen piece and there's a couple different, it could either be fascism fallen or it could be democracy fallen. So I was, you know, it's not about anything specific, but uh, you know, I, I guess I was, thinking about sculptures and, and public sculptures, civic sculptures, what do they mean? Um, Cause I make kind of civic sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, um, anyway, that's part of what I was thinking about in this piece. I hope, does that make sense? It's Yeah, it really does. And good. when I was looking at it, you know, before I heard your words that I, I was like, that looks kind of like something that would be on a government building and that got yeah pulled down for some reason. <laughs> so I think right. you really captured that. Good. Well, that's what I was thinking about. This is a big uh, hand. This is a big hand. This is a, a copy or a, a, of my wife's hand. This piece is called Judy's Hand Pavilion. 
And I was, at, I was invited specifically to create a pavilion, something that people could get under and, you know, which was a real challenge. And I, I don't know, long story short, how I got to it, but I thought of like, what's the least you could do to make a structure? And I was kind of playing around and part of what I do in my work, which maybe ties into the book that I've suggested is I'm always going back and forth between high and low, between mm -hmm. the simplest gesture or the most ubiquitous gesture that everybody makes and then a higher, you know, um, high modernist or high art kind of gesture. So thinking about that, this really simple, like what's the simplest way to make a structure? And I just, and I took my wife's hand, made a mold of it and blew it up really big. Um, and I was also thinking about women and monuments. And I mean, I think it's about a lot of different things. And also it's like my wife. So to make a monument kind of of my wife um, uh, and of her hand, she's, you know, it's a working kind of hand in a way. It's not mm -hmm. a young surrealist hand. So that's part of what I was thinking about, but this is a permanent piece in uh, Cleveland. Cleveland, okay. And when you were, did you have to cast her hand? I cast thing? her hand and then we had it digitally scanned and blown up. And then there was still quite a lot of finishing work. The skin mm -hmm. and stuff is actually was all kind of applied afterwards. And I made it silver because I didn't want any one race. I didn't want it to be a Caucasian hand or any, you know, like what, what race would it be? Mm -hmm. um, so I made it silver, which kind of, made it go with this industrial history of the city. And it also made it weirdly kind of classical at the same time. So even though it's sort of computer generated, there's also a hand hand aspect to it. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I, Beautiful. I, I, I could go on and on about any of these pieces. <laughs> I, I, I love them. I love this. I'm going to have to go on Instagram and look up people's selfies and like pictures of this because I'm sure like this is wonderful. I love it. All right, um, I recognize this one because it was in one of the previous year's Sculpture Milwaukee exhibitions downtown. So did you make this specifically for Sculpture Milwaukee? No, not really. Um, okay. Actually, that's not true. I've made a smaller version and then um, I think I kind of bit it, did a big one. I think that was, I guess that was sort of specific for Milwaukee, but it's not, I mean, it could go other places and it did. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, this is actually on a campus at University of Kentucky um, now. Okay. But, uh, I, you know, people talk about emojis with it, which I certainly get, but I, really the, the impetus for it I, is I was thinking about like pain scales, you know, when you go to mm -hmm. the doctor. And, yes. and I even remember I, I was thinking more emotionally. I, I was reading some article about um, your emotional well-being, you know, and it and it's same thing. But we all know these kind of charts, mm -hmm. and it just struck me that that was a funny thing to try to quantify your emotional being. And so, <laughs> I almost thought of this as sort of a test, like you go by in the morning and you sort of look at where you're at, and uh, you know, if you're too near the bottom, maybe you go back to bed. I don't know. Um, so. I love that we we definitely with my kids it's something similar it's like how are you feeling today it's like well I think yeah I guess I was just trying to to sort of make again this both formal thing this structural thing people will know the artist Brancusi it references a Brancusi certainly um but then to add this weird sort of emotional layer even though it's the simplest form of emotion mm -hmm. it's still it's not abstract anymore it now becomes this these kind of emotions. And then of course the, the, you know, yellow for sort of sunny and blue for the blues, I guess. Absolutely. All right. So this one surprised me. So I'm going to show you everyone this slide and then let me, cause I was like, Oh, look at this beautiful deer sculpture in the woods. And then you go and you're like, Oh, that's not how big I thought it was initially. So tell uh -huh. us about this one. That's actually a photograph I got off the internet. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's 12 feet tall, this deer. And um, it's cool because you, if you see it from a distance, I mean, this is a great, this is where it's best is in this kind of wood. Um, mm -hmm. I've made a couple of these and they're in different different 
locations, but in this sort of wood, because when you see it from a distance, it looks, you know, uh, pretty close to a real deer. But as you walk up closer, closer to it, it becomes bigger and bigger and more and more somewhat monstrous. Um, again, I guess it's another sort of monster, this sort of sweet, you know, uh, doe deer, but on that scale, it gets this other, has this other sort of power. And there's a lot of ways to talk about this piece. Um, you know, it, it's playing on a very kitsch tradition too of fake fiberglass deers people put in their front yards. I mean, I'm always taking things, but just tweaking them a little bit. And uh, this, so this is my, my version of a, of a uh, lawn ornament, I guess. But I like the, I, I mean, you can talk about it in sort of environmental terms. Deer are interesting. I mean, I know probably you feel that way in Milwaukee too. On one level, they're sweet and cute, but they're, you know, if you're a gardener or a, or a, a farmer, they're a menace, right? They're just like mm -hmm. giant rats. So they're, I, I like that. They're complicated emotionally, I think. Yes, absolutely. It's like, why are you here? And But why are we here in the city taking up their space when they're in art? Right. So yeah, I'm, I very much like that. <laughs> I should say, I should say, um, you should go, could you go back just for a second? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned selfies and stuff, and it's been great with these public art pieces that uh, they have this, again, this sort of other life Mm -hmm. selfies and I mean it's I don't want to say that that wasn't I mean it was sort of intended I mean I do want them to be this so I just like that that they become you know there's the first person experience of seeing them and then there's then the way they dissipate I mean mm -hmm. you know, the they really become for the for the public you know and you kind of it's like writing a book where once you've written the words and published it it becomes yeah people to experience and how they will and yeah I like this and yeah. these pieces are appropriate for this type of consumption whereas I feel some pieces are not appropriate like if we would see like somebody doing something like this at a war memorial or a right. memorial to those that died in a terrible like the holocaust or something and I'm like mm, uh -huh. but like this is meant to be joyful and celebrational and enjoyed so I love yeah. that Yeah, I hear. <laughs> um, this is in Dallas. I originally made this for Chicago, but it's in Dallas. This is 30 feet tall. And, um, you know, again, I'm trying to just charge the space. I'm trying to make something that's not passive, that's sort of, and an eyeball is one of the most sort of, you know, used images throughout history. It's kind of a, a surrealist cliche in a way. And that was the idea was to put you, if you know, like a Salvador Dali painting or, a, mm -hmm. or you know, a Magritte painting, I thought it would put the viewer um, into a space like that. I mean, some public art, you know, De Subaru or something, it formally does something to the space. And I wanted to do something more psychological to the space, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Definitely. When they move this, how do they move it? Because I could just imagine it on like a flatbed going down the highway. No, it's, like it's a, no, it's I mean, thirty feet. It's a, it's it's made out of twenty five parts, and it okay. really has to be almost rebuilt every time it's put together. I mean, not not quite, but it all the seams have to have to be re sanded and re you know re fiberglassed, and it's an enormous uh, undertaking. So it's not like you move it that quick that much. The deer is pretty funny because that's been moved across the country and you know and yeah. it's one, one piece on a on a flatbed truck. So that's got a I love. good comment. Do you get to go with then to make sure that it's sometimes. I mean okay. sometimes or I'll go for parts of it, you know, for installation. I'll, you know, yeah. That's cool. I would be like, yes, I want to come. <laughs> All right, um, I love these pieces. Um, do you want me to kind of, there's, I think six or seven images. Do you, you want- just, Why don't you just run through them? Cause we're going, I think we're running out of time already. I'm All right. Right. right, so these are- this is, your... this is just another example. I've made these snowmen over the years that are snow people over the years. They're not gendered, 
<laughs> but I, I thought of them as, um, you know, they're, they're vernacular sculptures that everybody makes, or a lot of me, people in the Midwest at least make, you know, figurative sculptures. Um, and I wanted to just kind of honor them. And then there, the other, I, also, I wanted to see if, you know, can I take something so silly, so banal, so just every day, but treat it seriously, treat it with kind of emotional pathos. That, that's the goal anyway. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of sad snowmen. They're kind of, uh, and everything on them, like the Coke, if you go forward, it's all, that's painted and it's cast and the, all these are cast. The leaves are all cut out of metal. So it's all fake. The snow is made out of crushed glass and resin. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's this faux trick too. All right. When we, we practice, I got, I think I saw this bear for a minute. <laughs> um, this is a weird one to talk about. I don't know, it's a surreal, you know, bear. Again, I think I'm trying to do different styles together at once. Um, I don't know, there's not a lot I can say about this piece. It's such a, <laughs> weird, right. it's a weird piece. It's it's behind me, I have, I have one of them behind me. I guess I was, I mean, I, I thought about this cartoony, I don't know why it's American, but I thought of it as this kind of big overweight sort of American and it's also taken from you know those cheesy sort of bear you know there's bear sculptures um mm -hmm. uh, like chainsaw sculptures and yep. and it seems like in sculpt and mascots for you know Yogi Bear Park and stuff I was thinking about all of that stuff but then he's got these weird visionary sort of psychedelic eyes that uh I don't know. I, I was trying to get a little less specific and a little more uh, surreal, I think, in this piece. Really, was... the bear really draws you in with those eyes. If you're like, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Now, this sounds really crazy, too, but there was something, again, I'm always sculpturally, there's something about the, uh, this very, very modeled surface and then the eyes are made with my thumbs and there's something about that gesture breaking the illusion this is mm -hmm. this is so pretentious but it's sort of like Rodin breaking the illusion with you know acknowledging that it's clay so mm -hmm. I want to take that same trick but take it to this really funny pop pop object anyway that was out there <laughs> I I think you everybody's it? curious you about it? that okay. mm -hmm. cool cool thank you all right. all right, here's another one. We yeah, check. Uh, this is Paul. I, I'll speed up a little bit. I'm talking too much. This is Paul. I was thinking about Paul Bunyan, but what happens if he grew up and he had some regrets and maybe was a little over the hill? So it's, it's. Uh, I did this, this is an older, or I mean somewhat older. It's when we first entered the first Gulf War and there was a lot of discussion about America with like the weight of the world on its shoulders. And, and I always thought of Paul Bunyan as this kind of cartoony image of manifest destiny. But mm -hmm. I thought, he's, you know, what ha you know, I wanted to take that and mash it up with like a, a King Lear sort of figure, a figure of regret and, and gravitas. And like I said, over the hill. His, mm -hmm. his act, Definitely, he, he you know, misses Babe. He misses Babe. You got it. Oh, and here we are okay. back. Well, we talked about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. already. Hello, Blood Monster. Go see it. Uh, I think this might be one of the last ones. Yes. It's actually about, I think this is also 12 feet tall. It's a little bit different. If you know the Calder that's downtown, Alexander Calder piece called Flamingo, mm -hmm. uh, I was riffing on that. This is called Crow, and it's a sort of an abstraction of a crow. And so much about, you know, I, my work flips around. I go to pop culture, I go to folk, I go to modernism. And here I think I'm thinking about modernist sort of shapes and, and designs, but modernism was so positive and so forward thinking. I wanted to make a kind of a darker, more, more dystopian sort of modernism. So this sculpture is, uh, again, that's, that's, that's hard to, I don't know if that makes any sense, but- um, No, it does. 
Um, so anyway, it's a kind of a modernist abstracted crow, but crows are both, I mean, they have of course all the, all the negative or, or omens of death, but they're also smart and complicated uh, creatures. So uh, anyway, that's, that's cool. It's big. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the fantasy is that this is sort of a, a big sculpture in a square somewhere in the future, you know, in some, mm -hmm. some Blade Runner-esque dystopian city. I hope so, and the crows can all land by it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that um, um, is our pictures of your work that we've shared, and then um, I'll make sure to include Tony's website, which has so many more things that you can look at and appreciate and see. So I will include that later. Um, but you did include a few more books that you wanted yeah. to quick recommend okay. for some further reading and insight into maybe. Yes, the, stuff. The, the, uh, the, the same guy that wrote Fantasyland just I think in September came out with another book called Evil Geniuses. This one's a little more, I mean, it's about Oh, you know, the Koch brothers and um, and basically how after the 19, well, 70s, um, how all these things coalesce to um, make the poor poorer and the rich richer, basically. But there's another part of it that the, that's kind of more. So it's a lot of that. It's a little more political. But there's another part of it that I find really interesting that is about, he thinks that we're in this state of stasis culturally where we're just in constant nostalgia. And it's kind of interesting if you think about like how people dressed in the 1990s versus now, not really that different. It's jeans, t-shirts and, and tennis shoes, you know? And, but you compare that to like 1959 versus 1979, for example. So anyway, that's the part of this book that I find kind of interesting but it's complicated and I'm still figuring it out so let's keep going <laughs> all right so the truth of the matter is I, I mean when I was asked about this I was kind of like oh I feel like a fake I'm not that big of I do read all the time but I read a lot of silly stuff and my really my what I read more than anything are biographies and I've read them since I was a little kid and I read tons of them and lots of them are on artists this was a big two volume <laughs> book I read this year um, on Matisse. So I read a lot of stuff about artists. It's great reading about artists because you see how they're insecure and you know you see all their human foibles. So being an artist, that's a fun thing to read, but we'll keep going. He was kind of boring as a person, Matisse. This was fun, he, uh, Mad Enchantment. There's a lot, several books by this guy, Ross King, who's written about um, Manet and Michelangelo, a great book by him. This was a book I read recently. It's about Monet's, and these some of these books you could read in just a few days, but this is about mm -hmm. his later water lily paintings. I mean, this is when he was in his seventies and it's fascinating. And also he was insecure and he was trying to give it to the city of Paris and then he took it back. And he was jealous of Rodin because Rodin was gave Paris his museum. Anyway, it's a fun read and it was, also hated in the beginning and fell apart. And um, anyway, it's just, a. if you're, I don't know, I love this stuff, I read. Mm -hmm. Biographies are one of the most popular types of books at the location that I work at. So I, I have a patron that goes there and I think they're reading every biography that we have. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. great. So all reading is good reading. There's nothing all silly all about reading. biographies. Okay, <laughs> now this one. <laughs> so I, I think I said before, before we, that I had this epiphany getting ready today that I like, cause I was trying to think like, what is the reading I'm doing? Cause I've read, you know, I've read a lot of stuff that I can point to my work, but it's all the obvious stuff. But how is the stuff that I read all the time? And I realized that I like to read serious things about silly subjects. So, mm -hmm. um, and most of the, most of the um, biographies, they're kind of, what do you call it, boilerplate? They're not actually that interesting the way they're written, but mm -hmm. it's okay. I mean, like a Walter Isaacson, I love that, just quote, mm -hmm. after quote. But this book, Dino, by this guy, Nick Tasha's, is gorgeous. It's more like literature. It's just written 
really, really beautifully. It's it's gritty. He's uh, this guy Nick Tosh's was a was a um, kind of like a Hunter S. Thompson character. Wrote a but rock critic, and he and but this is a book I highly recommend about Dean Martin. Dino, you know, but it's it's just I mean it's it's. I don't know if you would call it poetic, but um, mm -hmm. it's really beautifully written. Dark, I mean, dark Americana, but uh, fun. Okay, awesome. let's see what else I have here. Right. Oh, this is just another nerd book, sculptor book I read recently. I mean, you know, Noguchi was somebody I never thought that much about, but after reading this, it made me consider more things and you, you know, I feel I feel like I learned like there's always like one sentence out of everything I read that I can mm -hmm. learn a little something from. So, plus yeah. artists are fun because they're usually like have no morals, so it's real salacious, <laughs> you know. Like he slept with every, you know, Noguchi mm -hmm. slept with everybody, so that makes a fun read too. But oh yeah, definitely. Kind of boring, but yeah. <laughs> and here's but, what we were looking yeah, forward to getting to, Celine. <laughs> Well, there's a great series of books called 33 and a Third, which are each one of them is a little book about an album uh, and a different writer will write about an album. And this book, oh, I, it's been 10, 12 years ago, I guess I read this for the first time, a friend of mine. I mean, everything I read, somebody else tells me to read, I, you know, that's why. And a friend of mine told me about this book and this guy basically just, he, he took on his own taste and he was like, why do I hate Celine Dion that much? And he kind of like does an inquisition of himself and sort of breaks down. And he, so it starts with like Italian opera. Why is that okay? And why, you know, talk and like, why is heavy metal cool? Even though it's just as melodramatic and dorky as Celine Dion. Um, but anyway, it's probably a little dated at this point. This book came out when she was at the height of her um, Titanic, you know, uh, <laughs> but I love this book. This was like the perfect kind of example of taking something, but really going deep into it. And uh, um, anyway, I could go on. I read this book a couple times. I've actually taught it and I taught part of it in a class one time. I'm gonna have to get this for my my spouse who is very snooty about his music taste and I am not at all so well, I think this will be a perfect like yes you must read this now <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll, I, I, I highly recommend it mm -hmm. uh this is just another biography I mean I um Duchamp is probably the most important artist to me, him and, and Warhol. And this was a really great book. I wrote it, well, I read it quite a while ago. I'm thinking about rereading it, but I mean, I don't know, you know, if you're, this is dumb advice perhaps, but um, I mean, if you're a young artist or something, like Duchamp is kind of hard, you know, getting your head around Duchamp in some ways. And reading a book like this, it just, it, it's just, it's one way to uh, begin to access it a little bit. Maybe it's entertaining. I don't know. I have a friend who's a very serious historian, scholar. He's a kind of a, he's like a medieval law, you know, and Renaissance law scholar. And he said, biographies are the worst way to learn. He doesn't talk like that, but are the worst way to learn history. And, uh, Maybe, but I still like them. <laughs> They're the spark that can lead to further research is how I see it. <laughs> well, you know, I had this other thought because I'm trying to think about like, how does, what's this have to do with my work? Because I've done, I've read biography since I was a little kid mm -hmm. and I really love going into somebody else's mind, right? The, mm -hmm. that's, what's so, that's what's so great is to just being, and I think I like, you know, it would be great to be an actor. Like if I was younger, I think I might have liked to have been an actor, if mm -hmm. I could be an artist, because somehow taking over. But it's interesting because I do make art in these different styles. You know what I mean? So maybe mm -hmm. like an actor, I'm entering, you know, my abstract expressionist piece or my pop art piece. So I don't know. Your, that's, your that's, method, your method, artisting. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I love that. I think, yeah. That totally makes sense to me. Yeah. No, you I could don't. write a whole class on that. That's right. So, um, 
that's pretty much for the recommendations for the books. And again, don't worry if you didn't catch the titles, I'll send them to you later. Um, but again, you can catch Tony on your website, tonychazit.com, which I checked out today. It's got a lot of amazing photos and information on there. And then I'll get to that late. Um, I'll just plug this program really quick and then I'll turn the slideshow off while we do the rest of the questions. Um, so to, on Thursday, um, February 24th, um, our next program is um, this amazing program with Quentin Farr, who will be putting poetry to music in celebration of African American poetry. So I hope you all can attend. And let me just pull that down here. All right. Um, so, um, we have some questions, I think, from the audience here. And let me pull those up. Um, Tom asks, hello, Tony. It's been a pleasure to listen to you tonight. My wife and I love Blob Monster. Do you know what is its next home will be after Milwaukee? Thank you. <laughs> uh, you got a truck? I mean, let's get it over to your place. Let's, uh, <laughs> come on, front yard. No, I don't know where it's going next. <laughs> they say, yes, they have a truck, but okay. <laughs> I did see a, would you like to buy button on the Sculpture Milwaukee website? So who knows? There you go. <laughs> um, okay. Um, in the chat box, Tom also said, we like Tony said people think of Blob Monster in different ways. We think of it as something that would be in a Scooby-Doo movie chasing Scooby and Shaggy. It brought us joy to see it each time we drove by. Um, and then Francis asks, what are you working on now? Oh. Um, what are you working on now? <laughs> well, not a lot, to be honest with you, which is a terrible answer, but I, I'm, I'm kind of reading and drawing and I mean, I'm working on stuff, but it's an interesting time. I mean, like everybody, I was so overwhelmed with politics and fear and um, my last show, some of that work that I showed, the crow and the eagle head and the sun, I think in many ways were a response to a lot of global anxieties and local anxieties. And now that's lifted, you know, in a way. I mean, not, not I mean, it's not, but uh, in some ways that, so I'm, I'm giving myself some big soul searching as to where I'm gonna go with the work next and uh, I don't know I have a million ideas but I haven't pulled the trigger on anything not not anything that I want to talk about or I can talk about that's fair I think all of us living through this pandemic that <laughs> that's all we can ask right I'm not the kind of you know I'm so jealous my my wife is Judy Ledgerwood is an artist painter and she's you know, very prolific and she can go and a lot of artists go into their studio and they can just start working. They start. And I'm just so like, I go, you know, everything's big drama and I got to find the money to make it. And I feel like I start from scratch on every piece. So <laughs> I'm, I'm totally uh, jealous of artists who have a practice where they just go in and kind of work. But I feel like I, um, I intentionally, I mean, that's just the kind of artist I am that I've, I'm like starting from ground zero, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's an artist teacher in California, he's passed away, Michael Asher, who said, who had this philosophy, no knowledge before need. And I sort of like that, like I'm not gonna make something until I know what I need to make, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Hmm. So, um, okay, let's see. Um, Kevin would like to know, was the use of glass for the snowman piece meant to add an element of danger? <laughs> um, not really, <laughs> not really. It was just, it was to get the best look. It's not just glass, but it's gotta be crystal, which has got the most lead content. Cause glass, if you use just regular glass is kind of green. Um, so no, I was lots of experiments to get, just to get it to look like snow as much as possible. I mean, other people have said, I know I, I, I should have taken, said, yes, it was a juxtaposition between the pain and the, but not really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess it keeps people from touching it, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Little kid, they'll get cut their like, hand. Or something. <laughs> Very 
Very good. Well, it looks like that might be all the questions from the audience. Um, any follow up or ending thoughts before we let everyone go for the evening? Um, uh, reading is fundamental. No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Read some biographies and come back and tell us about it. You can find them all at your Milwaukee Public Library. Just come on in and ask. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, I just want to say thank you again so much for being here with us this evening. This was absolutely wonderful, and I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good amount of work that you are hoping to get done and are inspired by in the upcoming months and years, and we hope to see you in the future in Milwaukee with another piece soon. Okay, thank you very much, Beth, and everybody yep. there. Thank you. Yep, thank you, everyone. And um, just a correction that the Thursday program is the 25th, not the 26th. I am bad with dates, so that's my bad. And we'll send you a link for registration for that if you're interested, or you can always go to mpl.org slash stay connected. Um, good evening, and we will see you all for a future program. Bye, Tony. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Stop recording and then...